one of the main arguments of the technical analyst against fundamental analysis is that we cannot agree on the same numbers. Each fundamental analyst will use different numbers, different numbers for earnings, different numbers for discount rates. And I hate to announce it to you, but I agree with this technical analyst. In technical analysis, I have said this so many times, the reason why it feels it works because there are so many people looking at the chart and they all agree that this should happen next. And they are going to invest in such a way that it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. But in the case of fundamental analysis, if I use a discount rate of 5%, someone else uses a discount rate of 10%, and we are looking at the same earnings, the intrinsic value of the company that the other person look at will be half mine. So we cannot all agree on the intrinsic value. And in fact, Charles Iman, Gunnar and Buffett have said this so many times, they never agree on the intrinsic value of their own company, Berkshire Hathaway. In the last few months, I wanted to watch all the annual meetings of Berkshire Hathaway. I spent a lot of time on this. And the main reason why I wanted to watch this was to know which discount rate to use, how to calculate the intrinsic value of a company as precisely as possible. And I will tell you what I learned is that it doesn't really matter. The intrinsic value itself is not as important as many people think because you're going to be wrong about the intrinsic value. If you're going to be wrong, you're not going to get the same number as someone else. So why bother with the intrinsic value? The next question is then, what do we do as fundamental analysts? Should we give up, join the technical analysis side? No, fundamental analysis is still much better than technical analysis. It works. There are so many people who have been successful as fundamental analysts. First of all, coming to the discount rate, which one you're going to use. Whether you use 6%, use, use 8%, it makes a big difference. The academics will make use of CAPM and will try to find a discount rate based on the beta of the stock. I don't like to do this because I believe that uh, it's not important. If a stock has a beta of two or a beta of 1.5, it doesn't matter. It should not affect the intrinsic value of the company. We are looking at the company as if it is a private company, not a public company. So the stock price doesn't really matter in valuing the company. So that's why I'm not going to do as the academics using CAPM. We know that Warren Buffett likes to use the risk-free rate. That's interesting, but when the risk free rate is near zero, then he used something a little higher. And he said something in one of the meetings, I don't remember which one it was. He said that if you want to value a company, the most important number you need to know is what will long-term interest rates be. It's not about inflation. It's not really about knowing the precise earnings, but long-term interest rates, because this is going to determine everything else. If inflation is high, probably interest rates are going to be high. So you have inflation in the long-term discount rate. And that's why I tell you, if you did a risk-free rate, interest rates are around 4%, don't use 4% if you expect that in the long term, interest rates are going to be higher. Maybe you can use 6% or even bigger than that. Because even if you use 8% or even 10%, it doesn't really matter. And why is that? Because you're going to value only companies that you can understand very well. Companies that you don't understand, where you cannot predict the earnings, it's better to move on from these companies. Most companies, you should not be able to value. A company like NVIDIA, I don't know what is the intrinsic value of NVIDIA. I don't know how to calculate it. So I move on. It's okay to move on. 95% of companies you cannot analyze, just move on. They are outside your circle of competence. Now for those that you can analyze, you try to find a number on the earnings that you can be certain about, and then you discount these earnings. Whether you're going to discount at 5%, 6%, 8%, 10%, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you have a margin of safety. When we are looking at the intrinsic value, what we are actually doing is just comparing companies between each other. If let's say I'm discounting at 10%, this is a PE ratio of 10. So earnings, I want to pay 10 times on the earnings. If I'm discounting at 6%, this is a PE ratio of 16. So I want to pay 16 times on earnings. I'm comparing companies with each other. If one company is trading at 20 times earnings, I know that probably it is overvalued. 
the main goal of the intrinsic value is just to make comparison between companies. It doesn't mean that all companies will look undervalued if you use the risk-free rate because the risk-free rate is around 4% today and it means a P-E ratio of 25. There are companies with P-E ratio higher than 25. And even if let's say all companies look undervalued, you would not buy all of them. You still have to take a margin of safety. The margin of safety is going to save you. So far we have discounted earnings that the company are generating now. But what if the company is growing? You have to discount future earnings, not present earnings. If the company is growing at 5% or 10%, it makes a big difference in the intrinsic value. But let's say you don't discount this, you just discount current earnings. You have a margin of safety. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if the company is growing at 5% or 10%, you know you have a margin of safety. The graph is the margin of safety. That's not how I do it. Sometimes I discount the graph, but always, not as it is, if the company is growing at 10%, I'm never going to discount 10%. I'm going to discount less than that. In most cases, I'm looking for a margin of safety, something that I'm not even considering when calculating the intrinsic value because I don't want to have the exact number. I just want to have something that I can compare with other companies. For example, with Meta, when I calculated the intrinsic value, I gave a negative value to the Metaverse because I don't know how to value it but I still like the company. So now if the metaverse works, I have this margin of safety. If it doesn't work, it's okay. I already gave it a negative value. And to have an additional margin of safety, I didn't even consider the net cash position the company has. When I'm valuing Lululemon, I haven't considered the growth at all. I believe that the company is fairly valued today if you don't consider the growth at all. So the growth part is a margin of safety. If the company grows by 15% annually, which I believe is possible, you have this big margin of safety. But even if a company is not growing, you can have a margin of safety. And when you're comparing companies with each other, the companies you can understand the best, the companies that are able to generate cash at a constant rate that you know for sure this company is going to make money. You will need to use a smaller margin of safety with these companies, but there are companies where you have to use a bigger margin of safety. For example, banks. Many people believe that banks are safe. I don't think they are safe. You need to use a bigger margin of safety with banks. They are not the same business. They are some of the most dangerous businesses I know because one small mistake can cost you billions of dollars. And speaking about banks, it is a little psychical because the company is going to make more money depending on how high interest rates is. Then how do you calculate the intrinsic value? How do I do it? I never use interest rates at 5% to calculate the intrinsic value of let's say JP Morgan Chase because I know that over the long term, interest rates are not going to be that high all the time. Maybe we have a recession, it's going to go down. So I use an average, I use 2%. And I believe that over the long term, interest rates are going to be higher than today. I'm not sure 100%, but maybe 80% sure that interest rates are going to be higher 15 years from now than they are today, on average. Okay, good. Even 10 years from now, they can be higher on average than they are today. So let's say I'm using a 2% interest rate to estimate the earnings of JP Morgan Chase, and then I'm going to discount them. That's good. But what if now I'm right and the and interest rates and have a rate are higher in the next 10, 15 years. It means I make more money than I was anticipating. I have this margin of safety. The more certain you can be about the numbers, the closer you will be to the real intrinsic value. But you cannot be 100% right because you cannot predict the future at 100% accuracy. If I could, I would be very rich. Unfortunately, I cannot. So you need to have the most precise number you can have. Ignoring 95% of companies because they are too hard to analyze. And it depends which companies. For you, maybe you can analyze healthcare stock, which I cannot. Semiconductors, maybe this is something you can do. I cannot do that. It really depends. But I will tell you 95% of companies, for most people, it should be too hard to analyze. So just forget them. Focus on what you can analyze. Focus on companies with earnings that you can predict with high accuracy. A company with high margins, will be better because you can predict earnings with high accuracy compared to a company with low margins such as Alta Beauty which I will recommend you watch next. Have a nice day and goodbye.